there, folks. Uh, welcome into today's video. We're going to react to a couple videos here. Uh, one just came out a few hours ago. Josh Brown, we're in the midst of a bear market. We're going to hear what he has to say, and I'm going to give my opinion on that one. And then after that, we're going to listen to this one. Danny Moses of the quote-unquote big short, very popular movie book um, situation that happened in the, the housing crisis. Uh, Danny Moses of big short fame delivers market warning as banks get slammed so we're going to listen to that what he has to say about that and give my opinion let me know if you guys enjoy these videos i try to do these every once in a while these reactions kind of a new thing to the channel i think it's nice to hear other people's perspectives and then kind of give my points against their points uh, but let me know what you guys think about this i hope you guys enjoy it as always don't forget to smash and let's get into it i've been saying for weeks i think we're in the midst of a real bear market i'm hoping that we're at least halfway through, uh, both in terms of time and in terms of damage. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case, but you know, when you see, uh, let me give you, let me give you a quick example. We run, All right, let's see what he's long. He's long Apple, Amazon, AOS, uh, Berkshire Hathaway B shares. Uh, he's long Dutch bros. Okay. OCG can't remember that one. Uh, I think it's charge point, uh, crowd strike. If I recall, He's long Meta, long GM, long Google, Ugh. JP Morgan, uh, Matterport, interesting, NVIDIA. So it seems like he, he's a mix of, uh, you know, traditional companies you would think like Apple, Amazon, uh, JP Morgan, NVIDIA, and uh, some other a little more risky plays. Interesting. Uh, several in-house strategies, and one of our strategies took significant risk off last night as the month closed. And then Roblox RH, which is restoration hardware. That stock's been getting level the last six, seven months. Uh, Shake Shack. So, and then Uber. Um, you have an S&P 500 right now and a NASDAQ 100 that are, uh, you've, got, you've got longer term and intermediate term moving averages flattening out. And you've got shorter term moving averages like the six month and the eight month uh, starting to be in decline. And really none of that changes when you get a day like last Friday. So the best thing that you could say right now, I think is that sentiment is really bad. Uh, for example, in the middle of February, uh, we had a situation where AAII bulls fell below 20% for the first time since May of 2016. Think about what was going on. Yeah, in we talked about that obviously on the channel uh, several times over the past week or so. 2016, uh, it was dawning on us that Donald Trump was going to be uh, the, the Republican nominee for real, like in real life, and we were headed into Brexit. And, you know, you had serious sentiment issues in the markets, and ultimately that resolved to the upside. And I think this one will as well. Um, so I'm not, I'm not looking for an absolute horror show from here, but it could be very choppy. It could be very treacherous. So I think what that means for long-term investors is just, you know, kind of manage your own expectations and continue to pursue your strategy. Shorter term traders, I think you wanna tighten your stops. I think you wanna let a lot of setups go by and not pursue them. And I think you wanna take profits a little bit more quickly than you otherwise would. And I think you'll be fine. I think you'll get through this if that's what you do. Uh, but take real profits a little quicker. I, I disagree on that. You know, uh, when you really climb out of these cycles, uh, especially when you've been going through a tough market for let's say a six, nine, 12 month span, um, as soon as you get some gains, a lot of folks are, and I've been a victim to this past in the market where I'll take a, a profit real quick when the market starts to bounce. And it's because you've been going through a, a, such a tough market for so long that you finally make some money and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm up 10% in this stock. I'm up 20% and you're very quick to like take that profit and run. A lot of times, like you got to remember, like, why did I invest in a stock? You usually invest in that stock because you think it's going to double up, triple up, quadruple up over the coming years, not because you're going to make 10, 20, 30 percent off that. So I would actually caution people to rethink that whole like, let's take a quick profit because I haven't had profits recently. Don't run out there and just, uh, you know, grab any profit in sight. And if you're in a massive bull market, that's actually, in my opinion, the smart strategy to make because you know those don't last forever. Um, and you know, you know, you might have a six, 12 month massive massive bull market. And this is one where I talk, I talk about, you know, it just, you know, explodes the upside. You take out new 52 week high, new all time high after new all time high. Those are only sustainable for so long. And uh, when the market starts getting massively overvalued, it makes sense to take, take profits in that sort of market. But in this sort of market, uh, I'll push back against that. There's no reason to think that this is over. Uh, the price action doesn't say that it's over. And that sentiment reading that I just gave you that leads to the types of snapbacks that we saw last Thursday and Friday, but it's very rarely sustained. 
So now you've got an RSI, a relative strength reading on the S&P, uh, that's like 44. Not oversold enough to get crazy bullish, um, but in the middle of no man's land, really, and, and no real trends. So that's, that's how I see it, and I am behaving. Well, that's a problem with the, uh, you know, the trader community that I'm seeing right now. If anybody I speak to that's a little more of a swing trader, um, likes to reposition a lot, things like that, they all are talking the same way Josh Brown's talking right now, where they're like, ah, man, you know, I, I can't short. Can't short this market. This is time and time again. This is the, the folks I speak to. They're like, I can't short this market right now, but it's also hard for a lot of those folks to go long right now stocks because they're looking at this and they're looking at all the technical data and they're looking at all the the wall of worry in front of us and they're like, Do I have to buy right now? I, not really. And so they're not really deploying capital the one the way you might think, especially when small caps and mid caps are trading at the cheapest forward P's they pretty much have in a decade and you have massive amounts of, of big tech. And it's a very confusing time. We have in the market right now because essentially you you have companies like nordstrom kill it with their earnings you had target kill it with their earnings but then you have companies like facebook meta report troubling guidance paypal kind of reported troubling guidance a lot of the tech companies either didn't guide for this next quarter or or issued kind of troubling numbers and so it's like what do we believe here uh, companies that are reporting these great earnings or these ones that kind of really you know uh, obviously had great 2020 and a great 2021 so it's a, this is why it's such a conflicting, confusing market, especially for these folks that think on more short-term basis, which is most of Wall Street. They think on more of a short-term basis, and it's very, very difficult for uh, folks like that to make judgment calls when you have so much conflicting data because you don't know which way to turn. Long-term investor like myself that's thinking three, five, seven years out in a company, it's very easy for me to say, this stock's a stupid deal here. I'm buying shares, right? For a lot of folks, that's not the way they think. They're thinking about the next three to 12 months. And so the next three to 12 months, if you're trying to gauge that, dude, that's a tough competition. I'll tell you that. Woo, that's tough, tough. Thing and thinking accordingly. Doc, um, perfect day to have you. Uh, I can't think of many people who are more, quote unquote, uh, tactical short term as you and your brother and, and those who do what you do uh, mm -hmm. for a living. What kind of trades are you seeing real time in short term duration in this market? Um, a, a really short-term duration trade, Scott, is in uh, the SPY, SPY, of course, uh, the S&P 500, um, the 430 puts. Now, 430 is not a critical area necessarily, but they were buying with an expiration of Monday. And the reason I think they picked that one, Scott, is the uncertainty over the weekend. Now, th that's many days away. We understand that. But those puts... Um, are already closing in on, they were buying the 430 puts when it was 437 this morning. Um, I bought the 437s because, as you know, I like to buy out the money and sell against it as we go in that direction. Um, I haven't sold against it yet because it looks like... The reason we... people do that and they like to play something that goes over the weekend is because you could have some epic news come out over the weekend when you got a developing situation like this Russia situation where, once again, a lot of these traders look at that and they say, man, some bad news came out over the weekend when the market's closed. Get ready for the market to absolutely tank through the floor come Monday. Just push right down through that area pretty fast and hard. So we are seeing that. We've obviously seen the move that Josh is talking about with sentiment index, the VIX, um, moving up uh, into the multiple percent range. As you know, 32 means 2% moves a day. Um, we're not seeing that in the market yet, but that tells you people want protection. Um, and uh, I was with a group called the uh, Gentleman Bosses last night. The gentleman bosses. Oh boy, I can't wait to hear this. Uh, <laughs> so the VIX, uh, for reference, for those of you that don't really track this on a high level, which I feel like probably half my audience doesn't really track the VIX and the other half of you guys probably do, depending upon your sophistication in the market. Uh, but VIX is usually between 10 and 20. So when you start talking about numbers like this, 32, 34, 35, uh, we're, we're way high on VIX right now. Down here in uh, Puerto Rico, Scott, and they were asking some of the same questions as far as, well, what are we likely to see? And I said, end of the world trade only comes once. So you don't want to be on that trade and who are you going to collect from even if you're right. So what I'm doing is whatever gets beat up the worst, I get a little more interested. But short term, Scott, it's energy, fertilizers and cryptocurrencies because all of those Russians are using. We've seen a flood of capital from ruples. That's how I know it's Russian into various cryptocurrencies because they're being cut off from banking systems. That's a great point he makes right there. So if you're wondering why crypto's moving beast mode right now, 
Well, shoot, if you're cut off from the financial system, what do you do next? Uh, well, I guess I'll put my money in Bitcoin. I guess I'll put my money in, you know, Tether or Ethereum or whatever it is, right? Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a reason those are moving so huge right now. So because of that, Tether record volume of Ruple to Tether. And that's one of many so-called stable currencies that people would go for. And I think energy is just going to fly. You saw what happened when we released from the spur. Um, that's not even three days worth of crude oil, Scott. We're going to see 120 crude so fast if this keeps getting worse over in Ukraine because the sanctions will mean that energy is not going to be flowing where it's needed right now. I just pulled up uh, Bitcoin on my Hungry Bull app right now and uh, over 44,000 Bitcoin right now. So, uh, you know, crypto, who knows how long this lasts for, but with this whole Russia situation, um, you know, there's a flood into crypto right now where they're basically just having a flood in money. Now, the interesting thing is you could also get traders coming into Bitcoin and other cryptos right now, understanding there's gonna probably be a continued flood of money for the next uh, you know, week or two into the crypto space. So uh, could be, you know, obviously it's a bullish thing for crypto in the short term. How long that lasts? That's a big question, but it's, it's good for crypto right now. I can tell you that much. Big Short Fame is founder of Moses Ventures. He's also co-host of the On The Tape podcast. Danny, We'd love to hear your guys' opinion in the comments section, by the way, in regards to that last piece and this upcoming one. I'll, I love reading through the comments and hearing what you guys have to say. Thank you. Um, you know, Pete was you. just talking about what is on the books and, and, you know, to the extent that Russia is on anybody's books. There are also um, possibly positions that have gone wrong. Um, you know, on the part of many hedge funds out there, and we don't know how these financial institutions might be exposed. When you see big spikes in oil, you see big moves in commodities, someone's on the other side, on the wrong side of this trade. Correct. You only have me on in bad times. I look forward to coming on when <laughs> things are good. But uh, that, that being said, yes, you can't have these types of... Uh, I gotta say, that's actually pretty funny. And it's true because... Guess what? You know, when the market's really good, a lot of people don't want to hear any neg negative perspectives and they just kind of get brushed to the side. But as soon as things start getting rough when the markets, indexes are going down, stocks are getting hammered, um, all these folks from the big short and, and all these other things, right? You all of a sudden hear about them and you don't hear about them for years and years as a bull market goes along. But as soon as the market gets rough, um, you know, the Jeremy Grantham, right? All of a sudden he's been blowing up over the past several months. And, uh, you know, you don't hear much about them any other time, but when, when the market gets rough, all of a sudden, you know, all these negative predictions, uh, everybody wants to hear about it, right? Uh, in rates, currencies, commodities, without there being some, some type of damage. That's too much volatility. And this is the first time in a long time that we've faced this type of, of sustained volatility without the Fed having our back. And you think about it, all the liquidity that's been being pumped into the system that's found its way into various crevices and parts of the markets right now are really being exposed. And so this is not a healthy environment to be in. I think we're going to see whether it's loans to hedge funds, whether it's banks themselves. You know, certain banks are exposed in various areas that others aren't. Some are more focused on U.S. economy. See, so the this is very important right here, okay? Because what have we had happen since this time? So once there's a there's a um, um, kind of a, a, a mistake in the way investors a lot of times in Wall Street looks at the banks. They think that there's, they always put this out there. If rates are going up, that's great for the banks, right? That's always said. Well, what has happened over the last couple months? Everybody has also said rates are going to go way higher, right? And they've all taken up their numbers and everything like that. And they're expecting anywhere between five and nine rate hikes. Well, in that environment, you, it's supposed to be where the banks would do great, right? It's like, well, rates are going to go up like crazy. It's going to be great news for the banks. And yet JP Morgan, the biggest of the big dog banks have most well run out there, down 14% year to date. That doesn't look great, right? And so this is why I caution folks to, to think like, oh, rates going up is, is naturally a great thing for, for bank stocks or something like that, because it doesn't always work like that. I watched the correlation of when rates were going up from 15 to, to 18, and a lot of the banks didn't really do that much. And then actually a lot of them ended up moving up great in 19, 20, 21, when rates were super low, right? Or, or and basically almost nothing. And so, you know, I, I, that's a mistake that you're going to hear fabricated over and over again. And it doesn't work out when it comes to actually bank stocks. That's the most interesting thing, or at least not in recent recent times when you look at history. So now are really being exposed. And so this is not a healthy environment to be in. I think we're going to see whether it's loans to hedge funds, whether it's banks themselves. You know, certain banks are exposed in various areas that others aren't. Some are more focused on 
U.S. economy and the U.S. consumer, some are international. So you're starting to see a little bit of bifurcation there, and the stocks are trying to tell you which, which way that's going to go. So. So, hey, Danny, you know, I listen to your podcast and you've been talking for a while now that, you know, you don't think the economy is as strong as, let's say, some might suggest when you look at employment where it is and that sort of thing. And so, you know, banks had spent, you know, a 2020, just building up reserves, right, for defaults and that sort of thing, and both on the consumer side and on the corporate side here, but they released a lot of those reserves. So what That's is your... something even I forget about, all those reserves the banks put aside, essentially, because, you know, once the whole Rony Rona situation happened, everybody thought, like, oh, my gosh, we could go into, like, a, a massive depression in the economy or a massive recession that takes years and years and years to climb out. Obviously, that wasn't how things played out. Um, and actually, we've had a boom cycle in so many different things, uh, which just kind of shocked the world. But uh, all the banks were very, very scared. And uh, they put all these, you know, reserves to the side, essentially. And for how the banks are positioned for some sort of unforeseen credit event, because it seems like equity investors right now are kind of getting in front of that. Right. So banks generally trade with rates, right? That's kind of the go-to recipe for how the same way that energy companies trade with oil. But yes, things were already getting a little bit dicey before the geopolitical risk really came, came really to the forefront here. And so things were already kind of set in motion. When you think about 2020, when the calendar, when the IPO calendar and Wall Street really shut down starting in the second quarter, last year was an easy comparison, right? 2021, I think, was record in most categories, IPOs and so forth. We are now facing very difficult comps. We knew that coming in. This has exacerbated a, a, many of those issues, right? So the economy was already, I think, on the precipice of slowing down. And Dan, you and I have talked about this before. I was never a believer that the Fed was going to go really more than three or four times. Anyway, I'm still a believer in that. I think they have to show a little bit of strength and do it. But when you Interesting. start... Interesting. So he thinks the Fed's, uh, according to him right there, it sounds like he's saying basically he expects the Fed to only raise three or four times this year. Interesting. That's obviously much lower than uh, Wall Street has it. They're, they're at five to nine right now. Pull that type of liquidity out of the market. That has that has some type of repercussion. And we have been, you know, a lot of money into the passive markets, which I know you guys talk about on this show a lot. People weren't doing kind of bottom up work. And now it's time to sharpen the pencil. So a lot of these issues were already here. And I think we're going to now it's going to be really examined closely. I, I want to say one more thing in honor of Paul Volcker. Right. I don't think people have talked about this enough. Think about this. He passed away in 2000 in December 2019. Right. The Volcker rule changes were proposed in January 2020. They went into effect in July 2020. Well, the Fed was still printing money then, right, and putting a lot of money in, in this economy. So there was a period of time where banks then got the green light to go and lend more into sectors. And that actually is something that I haven't heard anyone talk about. It'd be great to have him here to examine this and to, to deal with this inflation in the market as well. Um, so, so when you think about all these potential risks to banks, Danny, do you think about these as potential or do you think that they are actually there? And how do you think about trading this? Nice earrings, nice earrings, respect. So the banks, I think, the large U.S. banks are going to be fine here. I mm -hmm. think they'll cut their losses, they'll deal with it. They're still, they're still very well reserved on the corporate level. Um, I think those will be fine. I'm sure we're going to see a couple of banks that have outsized exposure to something we haven't seen yet that's going to come back to us, whether it's in Russia or somewhere in Eastern Europe that we don't know about yet, right? But that, that, I, that I can't tell you what's going to ha what's going to happen there. But. Uh, I think from the consumer perspective, just to bring it back to what Dan was talking about. Um, oh, so the financial spider, you know, down about 5%, but man, J.P. Morgan down almost 14% year to date. Wow, that's insane. We're going to see, I think, a slowdown in, in consumer spending. We are going to see credit, which I think has peaked. I think people believe that. How much is a, is a consumer okay in the U.S.? Sure. But if oil stays at a sustained level and the Fed, I know we're having a you know, retrenchment in rates here, but if the Fed does start to raise rates, that all puts pressure on the consumer, especially those with floating floating rate debt. So anyway, I, I think it'll. I, I think we'll see this thing play out, but I do believe. So uh, I want to make a point real quick here before I forget to make this point. You know, this is why it's dangerous to uh, apply the strategy of this sector is doing good or these certain stocks are doing good. So I'm going to rotate my money here because you hear that talked about a lot, right? And going into this year, guess what had been doing great? Bank stocks. They've been holding up tremendously well. So if you were of this mindset, you would have rotated your money into the financials and into the banks going into this year, right? Because that's where things are going great. Uh, rates are likely going to go up. That's going to help the banks even more. And what has happened? Uh, JP Morgan's down almost 14% year to date. And we're only, you know, uh, we're going into the third month of the year. 
uh, all the banks are down across the board and some of them down actually a lot more than that. And so here you are in this situation where you're like, wait, I thought I was supposed to rotate my money to the banks and all along the banks have just got destroyed. So that's why it's dangerous just to, you know, try to play the hot area or the hot corner of the market because uh, very, very quickly things can flip the other way. That um, the U.S. banks are very healthy in terms of their balance sheet. I don't think it's a contagion risk among those Wall Street banks. All right, Danny, That's great important. to see you. We'll try and talk to you when things are a it's little important. bit better. He says it doesn't feel like there's a contagion risk there. That's in, that's important. <laughs> yeah, Danny please. Moses. Thanks, guys. All right. <laughs> Moses Ventures. Um, it sounded like, Danny, thought, Karen, that, that we're overestimating the strength of the consumer at this point. Is there anything that makes you think we, maybe we are? Maybe we're overestimating yeah. it. I mean, I guess we'll see retail sales, but I look at some of these names that are reporting and they're pretty good. Yeah. So I don't know if it's a question of confidence. That matters. Even if the consumer has money, confidence matters. And maybe this Ukraine you know, uh, situation may cause some um, to step back a little and just watch. Yeah, so uh, my, my two cents on, on that subject, by the way, get your free stock market investing mastery course. I'll be pinned comment down there and some free stocks from Moo Moo. Um, so... To kind of close my thoughts here, are we overestimating the consumer? I think there's actually an underestimation of the consumer going on. I think you saw that in Nordstrom numbers. If anybody's seen in the Nordstrom numbers, incredibly strong numbers out of Nordstrom, incredibly strong numbers out of Target. Um, so I think if anything, we're actually underestimating uh, how strong the consumer actually is right now and uh, how resilient the consumer actually is in this sort of market, right? And uh, obviously, if you think about you know, uh, confidence levels for the consumer. Well, real estate is very, very important in that number, right? Especially for the middle class, right? Middle class are the ones that, that own the most homes and real estate's extremely strong right now. A lot of people have a lot of equity in their homes. A lot of people could do cash out refis if they want to do. And that is something people directly look at and feel good about or don't feel good about. If you have a home that has appreciated $100,000 over the last year, which uh, most people that own homes probably have had appreciation even more than that over the last year or two, more than $100,000. You feel much more confident than you did when, when your real estate was worth a lot less. And so people's overall wealth has obviously increased quite a bit. Um, wages are going up. I mean, you saw the numbers out of Target and what they're announcing their, their wages are going up too. It's, it's pretty intense. Um, you have other you know, points in the market where inflation's hurting, but based upon the consumer data we're seeing, um, it's not hurting very bad. And the consumers right now, from what I see in the real world, I've actually never seen the consumer this strong, at least in my financial life. I can't speak to any other time periods in the past, uh, but since I've been paying attention to stuff since 2008, 2009, I've never seen the consumer this strong. So I will say that. I think that's an important factor. Um, you know, I think a lot of times we can get caught up into what's going on in the stock market in the short term. But uh, when you look at the online, just direct online companies, there's been some worrisome numbers there. But that's because everybody was forced to be online. So those comps are so tough to comp against. But when you talk about a lot of the companies that are in the physical world, right, um, a lot of them are actually doing really, really good and putting up some really strong numbers and some really strong guidance that I think is, is definitely worth looking at and is not worth uh, ignoring. Let's put it that way. So anyways, guys, I would love to hear your opinion in the comment section. As always, hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know if you did. Appreciate you guys joining me. Much love and have a great day.